This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, Happy New Year, and welcome back to the podcast for 2022. New Year, new guests, new gardening resolutions, maybe? My resolutions this year with regard to the garden are to work really hard at making a productive, beautiful garden that's beneficial to wildlife and to better document what I'm doing for my own future records. And I'm going to try not to worry about putting so much of what I'm doing out there on social media. So talking of new beginnings in the garden, and my desire to eat more of what I grow, this year's first guest is organic vegetable grower Anna Greenland. Anna has supplied produce to some of the UK's top chefs, including Raymond Blanc and Jamie Oliver, has created gardens at Soho Farmhouse, Kew Gardens and the Huntington Botanical Gardens in LA, She's currently establishing a market garden and gardening school in Suffolk and has just released a book called Grow Easy. Anna talks about working with the best chefs in the best kitchens and catering to their clientele, about producing pristine veg organically, about growing food in different climates and the fundamentals of veg garden success. She begins by talking about her journey into growing. So I started growing vegetables in Cornwall um, over 15 years ago now. Um, I had been living in London um, and had trained in journalism and was doing something completely different. But um, I happened to meet someone, um, met a boy who lived in Cornwall and moved down there and didn't really know what I was going to do. Um, and then Jamie Oliver's restaurant was opening up around that time. Um and the cottage that we were renting had 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 a little greenhouse um, with it, so I'd started growing some things for my for myself, but um, had never really dreamed of doing it, you know, commercially or as a career. Um, but with Jamie's restaurant opening, I got a job waitressing there, um, and I was sort of, I guess. Um, blown away really by all of the local producers and they had a big open kitchen so people used to bring in big kind of boxes full of lovely vegetables for the for the chefs and um I got sort of swept up in in that world really of of um the food and and the local suppliers and and so I approached a a local grower and asked if I could um, join the team and, and start growing for for the restaurant so that was sort of how it all began really so it wasn't um, it wasn't a predetermined sort of path, but um, something that I fell into and, and just fell in love with, really. Mm. Yeah, so you mentioned Jamie Oliver. I believe you've worked with some other chefs as well. Yes, yes. So I went from um, from working at Jamie's restaurant to working at the Lost Gardens of Heligan um, for, a, for a time. I worked on the vegetable garden there. Um and then I went out to America to to learn how to grow in a more sustainable way. Um, there weren't so many courses around at that time that were focusing on sort of organic vegetable growing, certainly in the UK. So, um, yeah, so I headed out there um, to learn and then came back and got a job with, with Raymond Blanc um, at his restaurant, Le Mans Marie Cap Saison. Um, which is in Oxfordshire, um, and he's got a beautiful vegetable garden there, um, which he was really, I would say, the first sort of chef and restaurant in, in the UK to, in a big way, um, champion sort of garden to plate, um, uh, you know, and, and have a restaurant that had, had a garden right there with, with fresh produce coming into it. Um, and so that was, you know, he was just, um, really inspiring to work with and quite a character kept me on my toes (laughs) um and it was quite a lot of pressure you know because it's obviously a Michelin star restaurant so um I've had friends say to me in the past you know it must be so nice sort of pottering around in the garden and what an unstressful job that is but you know when you're you're growing for that sort of level of kitchen it, it definitely becomes quite um a lot of pressure but yeah he made it he made it really enjoyable and um, is so passionate himself of anyone who, who's ever seen him on television or heard him talking will know that he's um yeah he's 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 a real driving force of passion <laughs> when it comes to food so that was that was a real privilege to work with him um there um and then from the memoir I went to Soho Farmhouse which is a sort of um 
private members club in, in the Cotswolds and they were starting a um, vegetable garden from scratch or they wanted a vegetable garden started from scratch. So so that was kind of an opportunity. I think because the Manoir had always been, um, you know, a very established garden. Um, I kind of was was excited to do something that was completely from scratch. So, so that was um, a good opportunity to do that. Um, and work with chefs again there. Um, Tom Aikins, the chef, was involved sort of early on there. So that was one of my reasons for going and working with him for a little while. Um, and then, um, as a, as a sort of a whistle stop tour, but, um, I've now ended up in Suffolk. Um, so I'm from East Anglia originally and, um, my husband's from Suffolk. So we've, we've wound up here, um, and are setting up. Um, a market garden and a, a well the plan is to have a gardening school um, here to run sort of grow your own classes and courses and things so um, that's uh, that's the nutshell <laughs> well it's an amazing CV uh, I mean I've kind of I've read about your background and I thought wow that is just incredible uh, and that is just I think probably what you've done there is summed up what what you've done with chefs but actually there's a lot more that we'll probably come on to but just to think about growing for chefs I think people like you say think you know oh it sounds like a nice job managing a market garden managing a vegetable Mm -hmm. garden Um, but then do do you actually grow for the chefs and do they come to you and say okay well this week I would like to or, or, or next month I want to use this produce or do you go to them and say look you know, this is what is particularly spectacular this month, or is it yeah. a bit of some and some? It's a bit of both. I mean, it depends on the sort of um, amount of knowledge, I suppose, that some of the chefs have. Like with, with Raymond, he, um, him and his team really knew the garden inside out and sort of understood the seasons. Um, and we would have a winter meeting always, um, which could go on all day, um, where I would draw up you know, the initial plans and then they would add in things that they wanted or wanted to tweak, things like that. Um, but then other projects I've worked on where the chefs are very new to the sort of garden to plate concept, um, then it's driven a lot more by the garden side of things. So, you know, we'd be saying, well, this is what, you know, is available each month. Um, so I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, the nice thing about... Um, quite a few of the gardens I've worked in that you know, the chefs will come into the garden. You know, I've always really encouraged that, that, you know, the chefs come in and maybe even do a morning working in the garden um, just so that they can get their heads around um, the seasonality and, and the produce and, and the amount of work that it takes to actually get, you know, that particular vegetable onto a plate. So, I think that's really important to communicate to, to chefs because, you know, a lot of time you can have, um, times you can have, um, really amazing chefs, but, you know, often they just are used to opening a packet of something that's, you know, very high quality, but it's been sort of flown in from somewhere and, um, you know, it's very easy to prep and it's really clean and, you know, so it's, it's good, I think, for them to, to, to really see the kind of, the roots of it <laughs> mm. um, when it's growing in the ground. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think to answer your question, yeah, it, it's definitely a two way, two way street, I would say. Um, but, um, you know, things like at, at, at the Manoir, um, there'd always be anticipation for, for the very first crops of things. So um, they were always really keen. We, we grew sea kale, um, which in, in a poly- polytunnel, strangely enough, um, which you know you expect to see growing wild around the, the coastline, but they wanted a really early crop of that for one of their dishes. Um, so we had some in a tunnel that we brought on quite early, um, and also um, courgette flowers was a big one for them. Um, and we used to pick, God, I mean it was literally over two hundred, I think, courgette flowers every morning through from sort of. Um, June um, to, to the end of the summer um, and I always remember yeah the chefs being really pushy you know when are the courgette flowers coming when are we going to get them when are we gonna, and you know you're having to sort of manage expectations and say look we can't can't force them any quicker than they're, than they're coming um, so yeah there was always like little pressures like that to kind of get that first early crop ready for them um, but I think you know when you are working with people who have a 
a base understanding of, of the seasons it makes it easier for sure Mm. I mean, I have to say, it sounds terrifying, um, especially growing from an organic perspective. Were there ever times that you said to somebody, OK, you've got loads of flea beetle, I cannot possibly grow you, for example, rocket, because it's just going to be full of holes. Were there ever times you said, I just cannot grow that to the standard that you need it? Um, well, I mean, we always sort of gave it a go, really. I mean, I think... Um, I'm trying to think of any disasters. I mean, I I know actually in reference to what you're saying, you know, with, with organic growing. When I when I first started the garden at Soho Farmhouse, they wanted a fully fledged vegetable garden by I think I started in February, um, and it was just a blank canvas. It was just a grass field basically that had been grazed. Um, and by June, they had a, a sort of high-end celebrity wedding in June, um, and they wanted a fully fledged vegetable garden. And I was trying to say, look, this is just unrealistic. We can't make this happen. But but they they threw a lot of people at it and a, and a lot of money, I have to say. Um, but even with that, you know, you can't kind of cheat nature, can you? But um, but yeah, I I really noticed that first year that I had there. Um, because there hadn't been a garden there before and because we hadn't had time to establish, you know, over time we got native hedging planted, we planted lots of herbs, lots of flowering, lots of um, companion plants, all these things to bring in beneficial insects um, and to keep on top of the pest problems. Um, but that first season, there was just nothing there, um, you know, like that to kind of um, act as a sort of, um, you know, a barrier against all the pests. So I think we had everything from <laughs> miles around, like every flea beetle, every aphid you could imagine, um, because suddenly there was this lovely kind of lush, um, all these lush plantings in the middle of this field with nothing else around them. Um, so that, and, and so we had some crops, but it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't a brilliant sort of start because we hadn't had time to establish the ecosystem and um you know, and I think that that taught me a really valuable lesson. That you, you can't sort of rush these things and um, to get those natural checks and balances that you need in organic gardening. Um, you do need a really vibrant sort of amount of plant diversity and, um, as I say, you know, lots of he healthy hedgerows and trees and things around to to buffer it, really. There's lots of sort of tricks and things you can use with, with growing organically. So, you know, you can get your kind of horticultural fleece out to protect against flea beetle and, and environmesh and things like that and lots of netting and lots of barriers basically to um to ward off pests. But um yeah, I mean I think it, it can be I didn't have it as bad as a, a friend of mine was going for a restaurant, a Michelin style restaurant up in Scotland and um she had to grow things. She almost had to walk around with a template. So they, they wanted sort of really tiny baby radishes, all the same size, you know, and X amount every day. And she she almost had to walk around with a template to kind of hold up against these um, baby radishes and beetroots and lots and lots of baby, baby things. And I think that that's even more pressure. <laughs> Luckily, I didn't have that. Um, but, yeah, it, it, it definitely can be stressful at times. And how have you found establishing veg gardens in different parts of the country? Have you come across different sort of challenges or has it been relatively easy to replicate, you know, a, a plan or, or the way you do things? Um, yeah, it's been quite different in different places, I'd say, just soil, soil wise. Um, I mean, here in Suffolk, it's actually, it's really different across the whole of Suffolk, but where I am, it's really heavy clay. Um, and that's been pretty challenging. It, there's a lot of arable farming around here. Um, so the, the land that I've taken on has been farmed kind of conventionally um, previously. So that comes with lots of challenges with soil compaction. So um, I'm really kind of taking my time to get the soil right first. So I've had a few seasons of, of sowing green manures, things like clovers and mustards and um, different grasses and things to try and just get the soil into a, a reasonable condition before I even start to try and grow anything. Um, whereas, yeah, previous plots, I mean, the manual was very different because that had been, um, you know, the people have been growing on that patch of land for 
a really long time. Um, so it's a bit of a shock to the system <laughs> um, going from there to somewhere like Joseph's farmhouse where it was pasture before, um, and that came from different pests. Um, that have been sort of in the grass from where it had been grazed. So, yeah, I think different, very different little microclimates all over the UK, really. Um, Cornwall was, we grew great tomatoes. I, I've never tasted tomatoes as good as um, I grew them down in Cornwall. I don't know why. I think it's just maybe slightly different, maybe slightly slightly warmer, and um, I'm not sure, but... Um, but then it was wetter as well. My memories of Heligan were just being soaking wet the whole time. <laughs> so I'm not sure. I think, yeah, I think definitely different different challenges around the UK for sure. But I think the key thing always um, is, is ensuring that you get the soil into a reasonable condition first um, before you try and grow anything because otherwise you're just off to a bad, bad start really. Yeah, and obviously a lot of the gardens you've worked in have been open to the public. Um, is it mm. possible to keep a veg garden in a public space looking good all year round? Yes, it's a challenge. Yeah, because I always have, uh, like, uh, yeah, I used to put in some quite long hours when I worked at the manoir because I just, I had this sort of fear, you know, that if I spotted weeds and uh, that people would always be casting a critical eye. Um so yeah, that in itself is, is tricky. It's not like just having a kind of commercial market garden where you you can allow it to be a little bit I mean I think, you know, when you're when you're a good gardener you sort of want things to to be um tidy or whatever. But then there's there's also a balance because now, you know, as we learn more about gardening and step with nature and, and wildlife gardening and things like that, you know, you um you realise that a bit of messiness around the edges is probably quite a good thing, a bit of wildness. But, yes, yeah, certainly, um, I think it is a pressure to, to keep it. And I, and I know with Heligan, Heligan was a tricky one. I mean, that wasn't primarily um, growing for a restaurant, although we did used to take quite a lot of produce to the restaurant. They had a cafe there. Um, but it was always that balance between leaving it to sort of, you know, for the guests to be able to enjoy and um walk around and um and then also not wasting it you know so that it got too big and too kind of woody or whatever to to use to eat so that was a bit of a tricky balance um but I think you know you're I I think probably I'm always more critical of uh, I see things as being more messy or more weedy or whatever than people that are walking around probably do um but yeah I think it is that is definitely a constant pressure as well. Mm, yeah, I, definitely. Um, I mean, I was thinking about, um, you know, you, you mentioned obviously you went to America and you mm. learned more about organic growing. Was that something that you learned about over there or was that something you always had an interest in? Um, it, I think I I had always grown that way prior to going there, just um the people that I happened to meet in Cornwall who were growing for the restaurant, that's how they grew. Um, they were organic growers. and So that's how I learned, and I didn't know any different, really. Um, but when I was sort of looking for formal training, um, it wasn't so so widely available. So I think um, for whatever reason, somewhere like California, where I went to study, has, has been quite ahead. I, I suppose that whole sort of back to the land movement in the 60s and things like that, you know, just a bit of a few steps ahead of, of us in the UK in terms of um, the kind of organic farming movement, and and I was really heartened actually to see, and it's and it's now happening here. But when I went there in, in sort of 2010, there was a hell of a lot of young people who were interested in growing organically, and um, you know quite a few people on my course whose parents had um, you know big kind of farms in the in the midwest and but the, the kids were looking to kind of change the way that things were being done and and farm in a more sustainable kind of regenerative way so um yeah and now i think that's really really happening here you know we're we're really looking um for alternative ways of, of doing things um which is brilliant um so yeah so i think that interest was there from the beginning um but it was just good to get some more kind of formal formal training in it really 
Yeah. Although when I came back to the UK, no one had ever heard of the course that I did. <laughs> so <laughs> it wasn't like going to sort of a queue or somewhere like that where, you know, automatically your CV um, has something like that on it. I think people were a bit kind of confused as to what, what it was that I'd done. But I'm so glad that I did do it because it, it really, um, apart from the fact that it was California, which was pretty nice, <laughs> um, it, um, yeah, it definitely kind of taught me um, things that, you know, at that point I probably wouldn't have learned here so so readily. Yeah, it obviously stood you in very good stead as well. So very, yeah. very worthwhile. Um, so you've written a book, Grow Easy, um, and it is for, I would, I think it's fair to say, people who are relatively new to, to gardening. I just thought, could you mention maybe one or two of the biggest challenges that new gardeners might face um, and how you might overcome them? Yeah. Um that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of like the most the most key things. Um I mean I think for a lot of new gardeners now, um time and space are probably um big kind of obstacles to you know, to, to really going for it with growing things. So um from a kind of a time time perspective, you know, everyone's busy, everyone's got busy lives and you know, I think unless you're kind of retired and um, you can really focus all of your energy on, on your garden, it is hard to kind of keep up with things. So um, I would say um, that not kind of giving yourself too many too many things to do and, and not trying to think you've got to suddenly grow like a whole massive allotment full of produce um, and, and just starting with some herbs really um that's actually how i started growing um and some some herbs in pots um you know particularly if you are space poor as well you know many of us now are living in cities and just don't have um big gardens at our disposal so um the book actually is um focused on smaller spaces and growing in pots um so yeah, I think some pots of pots of herbs are a really good way to begin. Um, I've got some favourites in the book, things like lemon verbena, um, which I absolutely love, um, which you can have in in hot, in hot water as a tea. Um, that's a must a must have herb for me. Um, but yeah, things like um, rosemary, thyme, parsley. Um, Cherville through the kind of cooler months all those things grow really well in pots so um, I think that yeah not trying to go too big too soon um, and if you can just manage to nurture you know five five or six different herbs in a, in a trough or window box or um, in some separate pots I think is a really good place to start um, and yeah from a time time perspective is a little bit more achievable than a whole garden and we've, we've sort of you know another another obstacle is obviously soil um but we've we have talked a little bit about getting the soil right first um and if you're growing in pots making sure you buy good um good quality potting compost so i would recommend an, an organic peat free compost peat free is really really important um because the peat bogs are being depleted by the the horticultural industry, sadly, um, and they're really important ecosystems. So, yeah, peat free is is important. But um, yeah, good quality potting compost, um, and then if you if you are growing in the ground, then getting some good quality well rotted manure um, from a reliable source or some green waste, mushroom compost, making your own compost. Um, if you own a very small space, then worm composting, it could be an option, composting with worms, your, your veg scraps. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think yeah, we've talked about the importance of getting the soil right, but that, that can be an obstacle and it's something to, to focus on first, I would say. Soil is so important. It is absolutely fundamental to growing successfully. If you're interested in finding out more about soil, you can go to rootsandall.co.uk and use the new search facility on the podcast page. Just search the word soil and you'll find links to previous episodes on topics such as mycorrhizal fungi, soil surveys and no-dig gardening with Charles Dowding. 
I've included the links to a particularly relevant episode for organic growing, which is 135 if you're listening in an app, but if not, there's a link to it in the episode notes. It's an interview I did with Nigel Palmer about his book, The Regenerative Grower's Guide to Soil Amendments. Really good stuff, so do check that out. Thank you to Anna for taking part in the interview. Thank you to you two for listening. To the Patreon supporters, and I'll be back next week talking about exotic plants and sunny climes in an effort to lift the spirits of those of us languishing in the chilly doldrums of a northern hemisphere winter. And I've missed Dr Ian Bedford during the hiatus, but he's back and he's talking about something very relevant to you if you're going to be following Anna's lead this upcoming growing year. Every year, from November through to March, our gardens go through their seasonal period of rest, leaving just the cold-loving plants to keep us enthused during this latent period for the natural world. And these plants will be happily growing in an environment where there's little chance of them being damaged by the leaf munching and the sap sucking bugs, who should all be dormant and hidden away from the lethal effects of freezing weather until the spring. But as winter progresses though, the effectiveness of these hideaways will often be tested. And for many, the bugs within will become exposed to sub-zero temperatures and perish. But knowing that the dormant bugs can easily die if not protected from the winter weather is actually very useful for gardeners, especially those who have recurring problems each year with pests on their fruits and vegetables. Since it means that during the winter months, when those pests are in their dormant state, something can be done to reduce their numbers in advance of the next season's crops. And it's relatively simple to do once you know a little bit about their life cycle and where the various pests will likely be overwintering. For common foliar pests, such as flea beetles, slugs, snails, sawfly and weevils, they'll be tucked away as eggs, larvae, pupae or adults, under pots and containers, or amongst the fallen leaves and garden debris. Whilst the dormant stages of whitefly and aphids will likely be attached to the outer leaves of winter vegetables and hardy weeds, so by having a thorough clear-up during winter, removing the plant debris and other potential hideaways, many of these pests can be exposed to the frosts or removed by hand. And in addition, the overwintering stages of ground-dwelling pests such as root fly, wireworms, cutworm and those small black garden slugs can be dealt with by removing all the old infested roots and tubers and by regular hoeing and raking of the growing areas which again will expose these pests to the frosts and the hungry insectivorous birds. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.